Hello from London and welcome to Ascend by Global Consultancy's latest commercial aviation sector global webinar. I'm Rob Morris, Head of Consultancy, and joining me to speak to you today are three colleagues from our global team. With me in Heathrow, I'm joined by Chris Seymour and Richard Evans, while in New York is our Head of Valuation, George Dimitrov. In the next 40 minutes or so, we'll share with you Ascend's perspective on several topics and themes in the commercial aviation space. And then, in the remainder of our time today, we'll answer your questions about the specific topics we have covered or any other commercial aviation question you'd like to ask us about. We have one or two already with us, but if you have any more you'd like to ask, please start asking straight away. But specifically today, Richard is going to take a look at the demand and supply cycles and make some comments about current aircraft programs. I'll then take a look at the evolution of the operating leasing sector and its potential for continued growth before George makes some comments on aircraft values and lease rate developments. Chris will then conclude the formal presentation, returning to the cycle theme with some comments on the implications of production rate increases for the market and supply chain. So without any ado, over to you Richard for an update on the cycles and the views on new aircraft programs across the whole sector. Okay, thanks. So in our last webinar, I shared some slides on the theme of what to watch for in 2016. And this was also written up in our quarter one viewpoint. So I thought it would be a good idea to check back on some of those and then I'm also providing an overview of where we see the demand and supply cycle. So to start off in the first slide here, I'll share, I will share our views on the aviation demand and supply cycle in a moment, but first a few words on the macroeconomic environment. Um, looking at EIU's forecast for 2016 as published over the last few months, you can see that their current forecast for 2016 is 2.3%, but this has actually come down just since the start of the year from 2.6%. So what they're forecasting now is that 2016 will, will see slightly slower economic growth than 2014 and 2015. And if you look at the chart, you can see that the two regions where there's been a reduction in growth forecasts are North America, or the USA specifically, which has come down to 2% now, but particularly dramatically Latin America. So only six months ago, EIU was forecasting growth of almost 1.5% this year, and they're now forecasting, a, on average, a recession across the continent with economic growth contraction, rather, of 0.4%. Other indicators that we can look at in terms of macroeconomics include the uh, composite leading indicators from the OECD, purchasing managers, indices, and world trade figures. Now, the latest PMIs also point to a somewhat slowing environment, whereas world trade figures definitely have been slowing over the course of 2015. Um, the WTO, the last quarterly number they've published is quarter four 2015 which only showed a year-on-year -year increase in global trade of 1%. Now, that is a directly feeds through to air cargo, where the last few months' data we've seen, uh, the cargo growth rate is sort of hovering around about zero. So, so hence, we've got amber for the macroeconomic environment, but a couple of those indicators, we're saying the trend is red. So I'll, I'll show some slides I actually showed at the last webinar. This is on the aviation demand side and makes some comments as to how we see things going. Traffic actually remains very strong. So I should say passenger traffic remains very strong. February was actually a leap year. So the 10% traffic growth in February really equates more like 7%, but that's still very strong demand. For quarter one, our estimate for global traffic growth is about 7.6%. The only real areas of weakness are South America, which matches the economic picture I just showed, which is seeing quite a fall in intra-Latin American traffic. Also, Russia, where international traffic has been down about 15% in quarter one, but domestic traffic is showing some growth. As you can see from the comment on there, IARF is predicting 6.9% traffic for the whole of 2016, which is certainly well above long-term trends. Another thing I said to look out for is what happens with yields, but where the, what's the quality of the revenue the airlines are getting? So what this chart shows is U.S. 
monthly yield information, but I've also added on what the, the change in jet fuel price is. So a lot's been written about falling airline yields, um, and the A4A, uh, the American Air Trade Air, Airlines Association, shows that yields were down about 5 to 7 percent in quarter one. Now, it's impossible to separate how much of this is due to passing on the falls in fuel price to customers and how much could be down to overcapacity, but we suspect it's mostly fuel price driving this and consequently airfares falling. As you can see, jet fuel spot prices are actually down about 40% year on year, which would equate to around about 10 or 15% reduction in total direct operating costs for most airlines. Many airlines are still partially hedged on their fuel, so this figure suggests there's still some way to go for yield reductions. So, in all, so it could point to some traffic stimulation from yield reduction, but it also points to healthy profits for airlines in 2016. Another metric that's traditionally used to measure the strength of demand for airlines is passenger load factor. Um, obviously, load factor is highly seasonal, so this chart also shows the dotted lines, which is the 12-month moving average. This could show that load factors have peaked in North America and Europe, although at what would traditionally be seen as very high levels of above 80%. Uh, in Asia, a lower load factor, but it does seem to be improving. So we would say that this metric certainly does not show any evidence of overcapacity as yet. So this chart tries to sum up how we see the aviation demand cycle at present. As you can see, five of the six metrics we have as green in terms of their current level, but the trend we have changed one or two of them to show amber. In other words, things are not getting better and we'll be keeping a close eye as to whether any of those start to turn red. Freight traffic is the odd one out, where both the current level and trend are red, with the correlation being with world trade not being so good. In terms of um, new aircraft orders, the latter, Chris will show some charts on that, but book-to-bill ratios have declined towards one-to-one -one in the last year. Really, I think summarizing this up, we still say that this is still as good as it gets. 2016 looks to be another record year for airline profits. We can't, of course, predict how this will evolve, but it's fair to say that some element of demand is being supported by falling ticket prices, i.e. because of lower fuel. This will unwind over the next 12 to 18 months, at which point the traditional underlying driver, which is GDP, will have to support traffic growth perhaps at figures closer to the long-term trend of 5% per annum. In terms of the aviation supply cycle, I'm just going to share one key metric here that we have shown before, which is the stored aircraft fleet. In absolute terms, this remains at about 2,500 aircraft, as it has done since 2008. However, the world fleet has actually increased from 19,000 jets to 25,000 jets in that period. So the overall proportion of stored aircraft has reduced from a peak of 12.1% in 2009 to 9.9% today. There is a stark contrast between the single aisle fleet, which has a stored rate of just 7.3%, the lowest since the year 2000, and the Twin Island regional jet fleet, which are seeing an increase in stored percentage. The Twin Isles is heavily increased by increases in older 747s and 767s, but also now includes quite a lot of more modern types, for example, 53 777s, 58 A330s, and 68 A340s. The stored regional jets are almost all the smaller 30 to 53 types that have come out of the fleets in North America and Europe. In conclusion, therefore, there is no evidence of supply surplus in single aisles, and perhaps not when you look at the overall picture, but we should perhaps be worried about the number of stored wide-body aircraft. So just like I said, the demand cycle, this is our take on the current aviation supply cycle. We show slightly fewer greens in the demand picture, However, we have changed the stored aircraft metric to green from amber to reflect the lower overall level. Used aircraft availability is another useful metric 
and this shows a low level and trending lower at present, so green. The only real concern at present is over aircraft economic lives. We continue to see retirements as the valve which is being used to balance out any what I call over delivery or perhaps over delivery of new aircraft. The absolute number of retirements has fallen down about 20% in 2015 due to the strong demand. But the average retirement age has not shown any increase, as might have been expected with low fuel prices and strong traffic. So I'm now going to move on to comment on some of the new and emerging aircraft types. Um, I quite like the uh, colour code, so I use this again on this. Um, I think the one on the 820 new is actually orange rather than red, but it's meant to be red on that one. So I'll run through some of our comments. Um, starting with the A320 Neo, we mentioned the delivery challenge last time, and Airbus has only delivered six A320 Neos so far. If I actually check the total number of 320 deliveries in the first four months of the year, it was 141 as opposed to 159 last year. And Airbus has actually ramped up production slightly. So there is definitely an issue there, which is why I put execution and delivery as red there. However, in terms of the 8020 Neo's order success, it's extremely doing extremely well, and the 8021 Neo is winning at both airlines and leasing companies. So the market position there is green. So the next one down, the 77 Max. I think all the evidence we see at the moment is that it's good program execution. There's been talk even maybe of accelerating the EIS date. And for the program itself, there have been a lot of orders, so again, that's green. But I've put market position as amber, because there seems to be some wobbles on what is the family strategy. You have read recently about the Max 7X, and the Max 9 has certainly seen some issues. So running quickly through some of the others there, the A330 Neo, uh, the only reason all the success is amber there is that Airbus has been concentrating on current generation sales and hopefully we'll now see some more sales. On the 777X, again, it's, it's going well, but we just wonder whether it's actually too large and there haven't been any new customers announced in the last few months. Then we get on to some of the new types there. And the C-Series has also been boosted by the recent order from Delta and the success of reproving trials. We've still got that as an amber there in terms of the market position. Um, and in terms of execution delivery, obviously it's running rather late. The big question mark is probably whether Bombardier can achieve prices which will deliver an overall profit for the program. For the Embraer E-Jet E2, um, we see it as being on time. There's no evidence to suggest there's any, any delays at the moment. And it probably just needs some more orders for the 190 and 195. But finally, we look at some of the new entrant types there, and perhaps we're not so uh, positive on those. The MRJ certainly still has the uh, potential to be successful, but it's running obviously very late. And there's still an issue around US scope clauses there and whether it's vulnerable to the fact that it could not be a change. On the C919, yes, it's got a huge domestic market, but we see no evidence the aircraft will be competitive or enter service anytime soon. Finishing off on the MC-21, potentially a better aircraft than the C919, but it's very dependent on Russian orders. And it is behind schedule, but perhaps no more than some other Western types have been. So that sums up some of our views, and I'll hand you back to Rob. Thank you, Richard. Um, please keep your questions coming. We've got a good flow already. Um, for those of you that have already asked or may be wondering, a presentation link will be sent out to you uh, post-event by our marketing team, so you will get a copy of the whole slide set, and in fact, there will be a transcript also available of this call afterwards. So, um, operating leasing is an increasingly important means of aircraft finance for airlines globally. As a consequence, the share of the commercial passenger aircraft fleet in service, managed by operating lessors, has grown from the less than 5% seen in 1980, through around 42%, which was achieved in 2008, when there were more than 6,000 passenger jets of 100 seat and above capacity in operating less all fleets. At that time, most commentators were predicting that the growth in such fleets would continue, and that by the end of this decade, or perhaps even earlier, we would see around 50% of the world's commercial passenger jets managed within the fleets of operating lessors. 
Yeah, since 2008, we have seen a stagnation of the market share, and today the overall leasing fleet remains around 42% of the global total. With around 45% of the ubiquitous single aisles, and just more than 30% of twin aisles managed by lessors. Returning to that market share growth, very simply arithmetically, if the trend we saw through 2008 had continued, a very clear linear market trend, then 50% market share would have been achieved last year. Thus, it's really easy to understand why such market expectation was set and being commented upon. So the question then clearly arises, can this trend be resumed? And can the previous expectation of 50% share be achieved? Well, simply on a graphical representation, that would require a significant discontinuity. And thus, it may be expected to be unlikely. However, the answer to the question is perhaps more easily understood through application of some simple arithmetic. Taking numbers from our flight global fleet forecast, the global passenger fleet at the end of 2022 is predicted to be around 25,500 aircraft. So to get to 50% leasing market share, the equivalent leasing fleet would need to be around 12,750. Today's fleet is around 7,220, that's leased aircraft. So a net addition of 5,530 required over the next seven years to get to that 50%. But of course, there's also a significant element of turnover within the leased fleet. Indeed, around 40% of that fleet seven years ago is no longer in the lease fleet, either having lost, left through sale to a non lessor or part out in retirement. So if that trend continues, we'd see a further 3,100 aircraft retired over the next seven years for a growth requirement of 8,630 aircraft to get to 50%. That actually equates to 75% of the new deliveries our forecast predicts over that period, close to $650 billion worth of aircraft. Even if today's 42% market share is to be maintained, under this scenario, lessors would need to acquire around 6,600 new aircraft. That's still more than 55% of the predicted total. So, whilst the clear implication is that 50% market share is unlikely to be achieved, that doesn't mean we won't see growth in lessor fleets. Indeed, since the stagnation in market share in 2008, the lessor fleet has continued to grow in absolute terms, with almost 1,800 aircraft net addition and more than 4,000 gross when taking into account that replacement trend I mentioned earlier. Continuing the numbers theme, one of the key drivers to this growth is the lessor's continued appetite for new aircraft. Over the last 10 years, an average 23% of new deliveries have been acquired directly by operating lessors delivered from the OEMs. This number is then compounded by their additional appetite for purchase and leaseback of new aircraft, which when added to direct deliveries, mean that on average 54% of new aircraft deliveries have been financed by lessors since 2006. And even though used aircraft purchase and leasebacks have proven less popular, there were still some 1,380 aircraft added to the lessor fleets through this route in the same period. So lessor fleets are expected to continue to grow, even if the market share has for now stagnated. But what would it take for the market share growth trend to resume? There are a number of possible drivers listed here. I don't intend to run through them all. But if interest rates were to increase, for example, airlines could see their access to capital tighten, allowing lessors to exploit their typically better creditworthiness and finance a greater share of new deliveries. More market growth is likely to see greater demand for leasing, but the opportunity to further leverage market share could be challenged in this scenario. So the reality is that if market share growth does resume, the trajectory is likely to be a much flatter than previously. And there is potential for the stagnation to continue for now, given the challenge of financing more than half of all new deliveries, even just to stand still today. Which drives to my conclusion for now, that the share of the commercial passenger fleet managed by operating lessors is unlikely to achieve 50% within the next 10 years. Indeed, I'd say highly unlikely. However, even if the fleet share declines marginally, as per the most recent trend, the overall lease fleet will continue to grow in line with the forecast overall fleet trend. The net growth is estimated to be around 3,400 greater than 100 seat aircraft over the next 10 years, even in this standstill scenario. Further portfolio additions will be required to replace aircraft exiting the fleet through sale at end of lease and retirement part out. So whilst the 50% share is unlikely to be achieved, operating leasing will remain a significant means of airline fleet acquisition policies for the long term. 
those conclude my formal comments for now. I'll hand back over to George uh, for some comments on aircraft values and lease rates. George. Thank you, Rob, and uh, thanks to everybody who's listening. Please keep your questions coming as we go along. You can just type them into the chat boxes. And so today for the next five or ten minutes, I'm going to give you a quick update of some of the value movements that have uh, happened and some of the value movements that our Value Review Board has made throughout the course of the last few months, and that is value changes after the original January changes which we made and discussed in our last webinar. Um, there's a summary list there, um, and unfortunately it looks like most of the arrows are red and pointing down. Um, as a whole, aircraft values have been fairly stable, but of course there are some types which have been adjusted. Um, perhaps the most obvious one at the top of the list is the 737-700, and so that has raised some interesting questions, especially because Southwest has been buying a lot of aircraft and uh, United has been buying aircraft. And so it seems like there is demand for the 737-700. However, that demand seems to be more opportunistic and so demand at the right price. And we continue to see trades of both midlife and older aircraft that were consistently below our values, which caused us to make a 10% reduction at the end of Q1. Another interesting type that we've reviewed and had to make some changes to is the 747-8 um, freighter. There haven't been that many transactions, um, if any at all, actually on the type. However, we realized that in consideration of where lease rates are and where lease rate factors are on other similar aircraft types, the values that we were seeing, especially on some of the older aircraft in theory, could not be sustained. So we had to make some reductions there. The 757 market has been quite strong um, for a very long time. However, it's not going to remain that way forever, and it just continues a gradual transition out of the passenger fleet. We have seen several transactions, both in the United States and in Asia, which indicated that our previous values needed to come down a little bit. So we've made some changes in the region of around 6 to 8% across the board. So the oldest 757s are currently around 3.5 million in half-life condition. The newest and youngest are around $15 million. Of course, those numbers can vary with spec and um, maintenance condition most of all. The A320neo is, uh, is probably the, the other jet that's on the list. And it's, you know, people say, is it because of the delays for the Pratt & Whitney program? No, that's not probably the reason, but we had to make a slight downward adjustment of around 3% to our new delivery values, market values, that is. Um, and that's driven mostly by the fact that most deliveries that we're seeing tend to be at lower levels than we had originally anticipated. We're also seeing that there's been less escalation on some of the orders between order and delivery than we had previously expected. I would say that the slight um, correction to A320neo values is not directly related or not directly a result of lower fuel price. A lot of the, the aircraft um, that are changing hands right now are usually from manufacturer to airline. Those are based on prices that have been contracted and agreed many years ago. Um, however, in a second I might talk about the impact of fuel price on lease rates for this type. Now the bottom half of the slide has a whole bunch of turboprop aircraft and there's been various, various changes. They're actually um, probably less important turboprops that most of the people on the call don't pay too much attention to. Um, one or two that I may want to point out is the ATR freighters. The reason they're down, especially the bulk freighters, is because passenger feedstock is getting cheaper, so it's just easier to convert. I mean, converting into a bulk freighter for an ATR is very easy and cheap. Um, the Dash 8s have had a bit of a small correction. Um, it's, it's partly depreciation, um, and, and it's also on the Dash 8 300, for example, we see some increasing availability um, because of aircraft that used to be in service to support oil and gas exploration, and there's been a reduction in that. 
And finally, we've also added values for the C-Series which are now available online. The market values that we have put out there are not reflective of perhaps the lowest price which some of the large launch customers may have achieved, but they are reflective of what a single aircraft or a small order of maybe a few single-digit number of aircraft uh, might be worth in the market today. In terms of lease rate movements, um, some positive news actually, and that, that positive news surrounds the A321. Last year, as you might know, um, there was quite a, quite a bit of um, downward movement to A321 lease rates, and that was driven by uh, some excess availability that was coming out of Russia, first with UT Air and then with Transero. Fortunately, those aircraft were quite young. Most of them were with Sharklets, and they were remarketed quite successfully. So after we saw a small dip, going into the first quarter of this year, most of the A321 lease rate data points that we've observed have actually been at slightly higher levels than we, than we, were, uh, than we were predicting at the beginning of the year. So younger A321 saw lease rate improvements of up to 11%, and on the Sharklet, the youngest aircraft were around 1.5% or about $5,000 extra on the monthly rental. On the other hand, there have also been some downward lease rate movements. One of them is the 767-300ER. There have been um, a lot of these actually successfully remarketed, and it just proves that this is the ideal size of wide body for a lessor, and it's probably the one with the biggest secondary market despite its age. Um, companies like Aircap have successfully remarketed most of the 767s that came out of Transero. However, everything comes at a price, and so sometimes in order to get aircraft replaced, lessors have had to accept lower lease rates, and we're just reflecting that. Some of the older A321s that are pre-2000 vintage, um, usually with lower takeoff weights, have seen some reductions in rent. It seems like there's quite a bit of a divide, and while the younger ones are more desirable, the older aircraft are less desirable, and in some cases being condemned to intra-Europe operations. The A320neo lease rate reduction, fairly small at around 3%, is more reflective of what lessors are able to achieve for some of their speculative orders which are going to be delivered into airlines. And that number is a little bit lower than was previously expected. And in this case, for the lease rate, it is partly driven by a lower fuel price. Airlines are simply not willing to pay too much of a premium for an aircraft in a low fuel price environment. Although there is still a premium, that premium in the rent is shrinking. Finally, I'll just um, touch on the CRJ 7 and 900 series as well, um, where we've observed a few transactions and we've realized that actually lease rate factors are quite low on these aircraft, even though they're older technology. Um, we're actually seeing some pretty low lease rate factors. And combining those lease rate factors with some of the low sale prices on new aircraft, that they're resulting in actually a uh, lower lease rate at the new end than we would have uh, previously expected, so that required some reduction. And there's a few aircraft types where we haven't made any changes yet, and we don't have any justification to make changes, but the aircraft are on watch. One of them is the 737-700, where we're just keeping an eye on the market. We're keeping an eye on what people are buying for. The market is liquid and the demand is there, but it's always a question of what price. The 737-800 as well um, is currently seeing a lot of remarketing activity. We have not made any reductions or changes to our lease rates, but we're observing it very closely. Um, there are quite a few lessors which may be considering taking some aircraft back prematurely and looking to remarket those aircraft. So at the moment, there's a large number of lessors competing against each other to place 737-800 into the same airlines that may put pressure on lease rates. In fact, from our understanding, the, the, the lease rates of 737-800 are tending to creep closer to the level of an A320, whereas in the past there always used to be a visible premium. A330 lease rates have already been reduced significantly, but we continue to keep an eye on remarketing activity because there's a lot of inventory that needs to be placed um, throughout the year, especially 200s. Um, it seems like the aircraft are shifting and new operators are being created. The A330 operator list just exceeded 100 different airlines. 
However, a lot of those airlines are some new emerging startups or some weak credits or airlines which are new to the wide body type. And uh, they are usually taking the aircraft at rental levels that are probably lower than we would have expected for an aircraft of its age and technology generation. And finally, the APR72, again, at the moment, we're quite happy with where our values and lease rates are, but we're keeping a close eye because um, there seems to be some strong supply despite consolidation in the turboprop lessor space with some of the acquisitions that Nordic has made. We are seeing um, that lessors are finding it a little bit more difficult to place some of the ATR 72600. And I'll also just give you a quick sneak preview of what to expect in our base value revisions which are coming out mid-year. Um, we are just working on those at the moment, and the new base values will be re released on the 1st of July. We will give you in our next webinar a much more detailed overview of exactly what's happening, but I guess we've already set some of the key variables and macroeconomic inputs which we take from external sources. One of them is the GDP growth rate. In last year's forecast, we were using 2.4%. This year, we're going to use 2.6%, and that is sourced from the Economist Intelligence Unit. The other change is the rate of change of fuel price, which is what really influences future values rather than the absolute fuel price. And last year, the prediction was that fuel price was going to be climbing at 2.5% per annum from a very low level. This year, I guess, the IMS expectation is that oil price will be growing at a slower rate. In other words, the expectation is that low, price, low fuel prices are here to stay for some time, so the growth rate in fuel price is only 1.5%. Both of these changes tend to have a small positive impact on our future value curve, generally speaking. And those changes, in some cases, are hardly visible. In other cases, they're visible mid-horizon, which is something like 10 to 12 years out from now. But in the short term and in the long term, there's very little impact to the base value curve. As you know, we've made some significant structural changes to our base values in 2014 and in 2015. And this year, we expect that for most of the popular aircraft types, the changes will be a lot smaller. However, some of the out-of-production twin oil aircraft, um, such as 777-200s, for example, may still require some larger impairments to their current base value. And with that, I'm going to pass over to Chris Seymour. Thank you, and please keep asking questions. Thanks, George, and please keep questions coming in. Well, with the airline industry recording net profits of 77 billion US dollars in the past five years, and forecast to make another 36 billion this year, there's been record activity in ordering new aircraft, almost 13,000 new jets in the past five years. 2016 has seen a slower start, but recent announcements have pushed the net order total over 320 with United buying 65 more 77-700s, Delta's order the 75C series, and China Eastern's 35 A350s and 787s, amongst the significant new deals. The firm order's backlog remains at a record high of over 14,000 jets, worth $952 billion based on the Ascend 2016 base full light values, which we think more closely reflects the actual prices paid and list prices. As a percentage of the current fleet, it has stayed around 60% for the past two years. Looking at the current firm orders backlog, the single aisle sector has a share of over 10,500 aircraft, worth $524 billion, with a twin half share of almost $400 billion, accounted for by over 2,500 aircraft. And the RJs have a much smaller share of just over 1,000 aircraft and 31 billion. By OEM, Airbus currently has a slight edge over Boeing at 468 billion versus 420 billion. This record backlog has driven manufacturers to increase production rates in order to open up more near term slots. We estimate that only 8% of slots remain open in the next five years. Production is used to increase in total from around 1,500 last year to almost 2,400 by the early 2020s. This relatively fast ramp up 
by almost 50% in five years, will have implications for supply chain, which we'll discuss later. The main focus of increase is in the single R sector and the 80, 20 and 77 families, which are both heading for annual deliveries of over 680 a year. Airbus currently headed to rate 60 and Boeing to rate 57 in 2019. And this effectively is equivalent to the Airbus rate 60. There are very few open stocks now until we think around 2020, but our estimate is around 1%. So anyone wanting aircraft before then will either have to rely on other airlines deferring aircraft, and we have seen some of this in recent weeks, or taking aircraft from their source. These higher production rates are certainly higher than the was forecasting in the 2015 flight global fee forecast, and that is the line in blue. We're currently working on the 2016 forecast, which is due out in July. It is interesting to note that if we compare the new rate 57 and 60, the dotted line, with the 20-year forecast from Airbus and Boeing in 2015, they actually leave very little room, in fact no room, for any other manufacturer. The left-hand column adds in the products from Bombardier, Comac, and Dear Cook. But this suggests that with the current rate going to rate, six, rate 57 and 60, there will have to be some fallout, either for the new manufacturers or a reduction in the production from Boeing and Airbus in the longer term. The higher production rates we calculate are driving a 5.4% single R fleet growth to 2020, but it's actually equivalent to a 7.8% capacity growth as productivity, i.e. more seats, longer sectors, increased utilization, has increased by around 2.4% per annum over the last 10 years. Also, the single R share of global capacity is growing too, by around 2.4% per annum. So these new rates actually equate to 5.4% global capacity growth to 2020. Allowing for low factor increases, traffic will therefore need to exceed this. However, this leaves little or no room for C-series, C919 or MC21, it assumes a single R share continues to grow, and it's assuming around 2,000 single R retirements to 2020, which is really every single R currently in service built before 1998. So this scenario needs above average traffic growth through 2020 to absorb this production. This will make the traffic growth cycle at least 11 years long at that point, and every single year in that expansion phase will need above 5%. So the question is, is rate 57 or 60 going too far? I think time will tell. In a twin aisle, and including the wide body freighter market, production rates are sometimes have been subject to increases and decreases. Overall, however, annual production is due a more moderate increase, from just under 420 to over 490 a year over the next five years. The A350 and 787 are the main focus of this. And indeed, production is increasing to almost 60% of the total twin R deliveries. The A330 was reduced to six a month, which is going back to seven on the back of Chinese orders. And the 777 is reducing marginally to seven a month. In the very large sizes, the 7478 is going down to just six a year, and the A380 looks set to be at 20 a year in the next two years. Based on our analysis, the twin hour sector still has near-term slots available in 2018 onwards, around 15% in the next five years, notably on the 777 and 8330. And this sparked some questions on whether the 777 in particular has cut its rate enough, given we calculate around 150 lost off the line 200 ERs and also 777 freighters are available prior to the 7779 appearing in 2019. So looking now at twin hours, this drives a 5.3% fleet growth per annum to 2019. And this equates to 6.7% capacity growth, taking into account this productivity. Notably, the last 10 years averaged just 3.9%. If 
traffic does not justify this capacity growth. Something has to give. Will we see lower production rates on the 777 to rate 5 or 6? Quite possibly. And the A380 looks to be going down to 20 a year. Lower productivity is not really a favoured option, as it will harm the unit costs. Will we see even more retirements? We could see more retirements equivalent to every passenger twin aisle built before a man mid-2000 being removed from service or into 2019. We think, even if the planned reduction rates are modified a bit, the outlook will still be for higher retirements. Finally, a word on implications for the supply chain and increasing production. Well, essentially, the engine OEMs will be building 42% more installed engines by 2020 with over 1,000 big fan engines each year. Perhaps of more concern, the industry has seen issues of seat supply over the past year. And the requirements here are for over 440,000 more seats being built every year by 2020. And that's based on the current average seating. 34% of the annual seats will be for twin aisles. And obviously these aircraft can have two, three, or even four classes. And this is spurring the entry into the market and new seat suppliers. There are undoubtedly challenges for the whole supply chain, and still question marks of whether some rates are going too high. Ultimately, as Richard was pointing out in his first presentation, the whole industry is reliant on robust traffic growth and no downturn. Thank you, and now we will turn to some of your questions. Thank you, Chris. So uh, we've around 15 minutes or so left, and there have been uh, a whole load of questions coming in. Um, so I'm going I'm to turn first, George, to you with, uh, with a, a values-related question. So given, given the strength of overall demand that Richard painted earlier, why are the aircraft values and leaf work changes thus far this year typically negative? Um, well, first of all, aircraft, aircraft are uh, an, an asset that depreciates long term. So in any market scenario, you will always have more downward than upward movements. Um, for upward movements to be visible, it means that the increases have to be so strong that, 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 you're, that the, the improvements actually defy the depreciation of the asset. Having said that, demand is very strong. Richard is uh, right, and, and all the metrics show it. However, supply is also quite strong. We have increasing production rates at the new end for pretty much all aircraft types, narrow and wide. And so those, that growing supply is, is growing together with the demand, which tends to keep the market in balance. And so a lot of that demand and a lot of that growth is actually coming because of opportunities to add capacity at lower cost both lower operating costs because of lower fuel price and also because of opportunities to acquire used aircraft at lower cost, as we're witnessing by the U.S. carriers buying used aircraft. And um, some other carriers have expressed interest in, in acquiring used wide bodies as well. Okay, thanks, thanks George. Um, so, so Richard, there's been a question about the 737 MAX and the 737-7X that was reported recently in the Wall Street Journal. So, can you just share any views on the 737 MAX family development strategy more widely? Okay, well, I suppose I should say first of all, we've got no sort of inside information on this. We just read what we see in the press. And whether it was coincidence or not that the MAX 7X news story came out, I think maybe a day or so after the Delta C series order, I don't know. Um, I mean, the, the MAX 7 only had orders from a couple of airlines, and both WestJet and Southwest have been close to saying, yes, the 7X looks good to us. Um, I wonder whether it's more about Boeing trying to save a bit of cost rather than it trying to meet market demand there. Um, the aircraft will be bigger than the 7. It'll have higher weight. Um, but the, so all else being equal, I think the unit cost of seat will probably come up pretty similar. So it will be a better aircraft in terms of lower cash operating costs. My concern would be that historically people talked about the 77-900 and 800 being a bit too close together in terms of size. Now the 9 and the 8 are still that same relatively small gap between them, and this could mean the 7 has also got quite a small gap. So you could be ending up with three aircraft family that covers a relatively small part of the market compared with perhaps what Airbus would have to offer. So I think time will tell on what will happen. 
Um, the DAS 9 is presumably so far down the development route that that will happen as it is um, currently understood, but we'll, we'll have to wait and see. Thanks, thanks Richard. Quick, Chris, a question here on the, uh, on the evolving programs that Richard commented on earlier. So the question quite specifically, but perhaps you can paraphrase it, is, is what production rates or what forecast do we see of deliveries for the MC21, the C919, and, and, and perhaps the C-Series as well? I think the easier one to answer at the moment is the C-Series because it's about to enter service and obviously has a, a firm order backlog recently helped by the Delta order. And they've set out their sort of plans for production wrapping up reasonably towards, um, I think, 100 a year by 2020, 2021. That seems, based on the order book, a, a sort of reasonable target. I think it's much less certain as to what the C919 and M21 will be. The order books for those are, I would say, have less clarity. There's a lot of lesser intense commitments and probably not much money down on those. And the actual entry into service of I think, both programs looks to be slipping a bit to the right. I would think that production rates are more likely to be in these sort of three to five a month in the initial years. And really depending if they can gain some more detraction sort of from the mid-2020s onwards. But it's going to be at much uh, lower rates than the, say, 8020 or 77. Thanks, Chris. So um, we've been asked a couple of questions about aircraft retirements, and, and, and the one specific that I'll try and answer just now is, what are our expectations for aircraft retirements in 2016? So thinking about retirements as being uh, driven out of service either by arriving at a certain age or the demand and supply position that, that Richard was speaking about earlier, over the last couple of years, retirements in, in overall volumes have been reducing um, as a consequence, I think, would argue of a strength of demand in the market given the traffic numbers Richard was talking about and the uh, relatively constant supply that we're seeing coming from OEMs right now as uh, they transition their single line lines particularly from current generation to next generation aircraft. So I think given that we see continued strong demand and continued uh, all this uh, constant supply and we'll obviously see that ramp up start to take place, I think we'd argue that retirements in 2016 will be down again. Uh, over 2015 volumes or at similar volumes in 2015, which were around 400 to 500 aircraft. So much lower than the 700 to 800 aircraft we saw in 2010, 11, 12. So I think we see retirements, um, as Richard said earlier, as being perhaps the, uh, the, the new supply side cycle, if you like. And with demand being strong and supply being constant right now, um, we think there'll be fewer retirements in 2016, albeit still at a slightly lower age than we've seen previously. Um, George, George, I'm going to return to some, some values questions. We've got quite a number of specific values questions, uh, but I'll, I'll start with one that was a, perhaps, perhaps gives you a chance to give a more generic answer. Someone asked, were there no value changes this year for EJs, ERJs, or CRJs? Perhaps you can comment yes. on why that is. Uh, yes, uh, there were changes, and most of those changes were made in January, actually. For EJs, we had some significant reductions in January, and we feel that those values and lease rates are correct as they are now. We are aware that throughout the second half of last year, and throughout the course of last year, actually, availability in some EJETs was increasing slightly, um, and we reflected that in our new values in January. The same thing can be said about CRJ values as well. They took quite a, quite a strong downward revision at the beginning of the year, and, and we're happy with where they are now. It's the lease rates that needed subsequent um, correction. Um, as, for, as for ERJs, um, those values are already at very low levels and continue to be reviewed and revived, down, revived downwards. But since January, we just haven't seen any further evidence to bring them down further below where they are. They're, most of the older aircraft are now close to part out levels. Thanks, George. Um, here's one that I think, uh, I think we might, might all want to comment on to some extent. Um, so the question is, do we believe that aggressive discounts in small narrow body orders in the US and the specific uh, cases raised with the United 737-700 and the Delta C series order will spread to other markets? Um, I, mean, I could, uh, oh, sorry, I, I guess I could start perhaps is um, that pricing was a one-off um, competitive move against Bombardier very clearly. However, there's nothing new about competitive and increasingly aggressive pricing, and it's not just driven by trying to keep Bombardier out. 
Airbus and Boeing are both increasing production rates. They've got ambitions now for market share, especially in the case of Airbus, who's aiming for 60% market share and has been quite public about it. And uh, most of the time, the way you get market share is by being very competitive with your pricing. They've got some advantages right now in terms of a strong dollar and a not so strong euro, um, which, is, which is to their advantage. And so it, 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 I would say it, it, it's not about a danger of it spreading. I would say it's already the norm. New aircraft pricing for the last 18 months to two years has been extremely competitive. We saw a brief period where there was some improvement from 2010 onward. That improvement was partially because of long lead times and growing escalation between order and delivery. Um, so people were kind of signing low values on signing the order, but then we're paying a lot more on delivery because of the long escalation period. But with increasing production, the lead time is, is going to start getting a little bit shorter once again. And so that will wipe out any benefits. In other words, new aircraft pricing, especially on the narrow body signs, seems for the time being to continue to remain flat as it has done for the last 25 years or more. Yeah, thanks, George. Well, I think I, I think I'd add a similar comment to that you started with that the, in the two campaigns cited were particularly strategic for the OEMs that won them, and consequently, it's very hard to read that that pricing as being particularly representative of the wider market. So, where there are strategic campaigns, yes, perhaps you might see pricing like that, but more generally, it probably can't be sustained over the longer term. Um, Here's a question that we might all want to debate, I guess, and, and Richard and Chris particularly, given the way you drive them up the fleet forecast. So who will win, A380 driven hub to hub or, or 787, A350 driven point to point? I think in general, um, the smaller the aircraft, the more opportunity they are to find routes that they will fit down to a certain point. Um, the A380 production rate is two or three a month. The 787 is going up to 12, and the A350 is ramping up, so that, that tells you something. I think the hub to hub versus hub to point is a bit of a moot point. It's you know, fitting the right size aircraft at the right economics to route networks. Yeah, I'm not sure it's a, a, a win, win or lose question, really. I mean, larger aircraft have always had a smaller market share than the smaller twins. Um, they really are sort of complementary. Of course, it depends on the business models of the various airlines. and for someone like Emirates, you know, their business model is based on having larger aircraft, the A380s, the 777Xs, 777s, um, for their hub and spoke strategy. Um, but certainly, you know, the, the smaller twins will always have the, the larger market share. Thanks, Chris. Uh, George, I think it's maybe another one for you, actually, and um, perhaps an opportunity to highlight long-term versus short-term. Will the, um, the current Pratt Whitney engine issues impact value of A320neo? In the short term, we see no impact. We are expecting that the issues will be resolved. Um, it can start to have an impact if the issues are not resolved and if the backlog of undelivered aircraft that were destined for that engine starts to really build up. Um, it, they've said they'll fix it by mid-year, and I think they really need to do it by then. If it starts stretching in towards the end of the year, it may cause some customers to switch to CFM for aircraft that are not yet built. Um, it could lead, lead them to losing market share, just losing market confidence overall. But in the short term, we, we, we're inclined to believe that they will fix the issue and we are not seeing any value impact for now. Thanks, George. Um, another one perhaps for, for, for us on the supply and demand side here. So can we comment on the oil price trend and potential impact on less fuel efficient aircraft? Um, well, first of all, we can't forecast what's going to happen to oil price. Um, it's, it depends on your stuff, but it's actually gone up quite a lot this year in percentage terms, um, but it's obviously way below what it was. In terms of supply, what we can say is there's a huge backlog of aircraft with contracts to be delivered over the next few years. Um, to absorb all those aircraft, we have to see pretty strong traffic growth. It's definitely being helped. As, as airlines go from they were at that fuel price, they've now come down quite a lot, still some way to go on that, we can be quite optimistic about traffic growth. But to get to the point where you thought people take all the aircraft that they have on contract delivery and, by the way, keep older ones in service or bring them back from storage, that just seems to be unlikely. You'd have to have such strong traffic growth to do that. 
So my summary would be, if the aircraft weren't on order, then yes, we'd see perhaps some different behaviour. But the aircraft are there, they're being built, they're difficult to be too optimistic about the older aircraft types. We are seeing some airlines hanging on to their older aircraft for a bit longer, like Air Canada, say, with AC-30s, but it also has buffer capacity. So, you know, if things do turn down, they can get rid of those aircraft fairly quickly, but they are a bit more economic with the lower fuel prices at the moment. I think you might say the same thing about the A747s, even, that they're yeah. using that, you know, to generate extra profits in the near term. Yeah, I think I think I concur with both with Richard and Chris's comments there. That if you look at the fleet empirically today, you'll see evidence that there is, in the macro sense, uh, um, a slightly higher percentage of older aircraft being retained in service. But that's because if you think about Rich's traffic numbers, if you think about 7% traffic growth, if you think about a 5% a yield reduction, a 5% yield reduction is probably giving you on a gearing of 0.2 to 0.5 or 1% to 2.5% traffic growth premium. So as Richard said, that, that can't, you cannot go on continue to reduce yield forever. You'll lose that traffic growth premium at some point in the near or, near or medium term. When you lose that traffic growth premium, then you perhaps lose the rationale for keeping those older aircraft in service because at that same time, as Chris pointed out, OEM production rates are increasing significantly. There's a big supply, an increasing supply of new aircraft coming. So in, in the end, the older aircraft reverts to their typical economic life of a single old aircraft, 22 years around about. One observation that we've uh, had so far is actually in an environment where fuel prices are rising, the values of younger aircraft definitely benefit the values of older inefficient aircraft suffer. But when the opposite happens, so as fuel prices drop, you see the older aircraft remaining in service longer, but we're not really seeing any improvement to their values because there's, no, there's, not, in, there's not a strong enough constraint to supply overall. Thanks, George. So we're running short of time, so I think there is time for one more question, and I'll, I'll finish on a values-related question. So, George, it's very specific. How have the values of spare engines and, and the specific questions around the 7B and 5B variants of the 756 trended recently? Um, it's an interesting question, actually. That market is relatively quiet. And when I say relatively, I mean in comparison to the trading levels that we see on the aircraft market, um, there hasn't been anywhere near as much happening with engines. But from the, from the few trades that we have seen, the market appears to be stable. We had some improvements to some of the 7B models um, as a whole. Uh, lease, rates, uh, lease rates did improve from their very worst, which was at the bottom of the downturn, and they're fairly stable now. But as a whole, um, the value seemed quite stable. We see some aircraft being sold, some engines, sorry, being sold at the back end for, for low prices, but they're usually in very poor condition. Um, and so, at the moment, I would say stability is the key word. Thanks, George. So, with time running out, um, thanks to all of you for joining us today. We hope you found something of interest in our content and we've been able to answer your questions. If you do have any further comments or questions, please don't hesitate to contact us directly. And over the next few weeks, many of our team will be out and about at various industry events in Tokyo, London, and further afield, so we hope to see you there. We also expect to have a large team at Farnborough in July. And of course, as 2016 progresses, we'll be running more of these webinars in the commercial space, but also in the helicopter and business jet sectors. So look out for notification of those, and we look forward to meeting or speaking to you again soon. On behalf of the whole Ascend team in Hong Kong, London, and New York, Thank you for joining us and goodbye.